tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. In a peaceful suburb of Los Angeles, a feud over a drug debt spirals out of control. An innocent teenage boy is taken hostage, and a family is destroyed. Jill Bierman had a passion for cycling. One morning, she set off for a ride through Bloomington, Indiana, and inexplicably vanished. Was she abducted? Or was she the victim of a tragic accident? It began innocently enough. A selfless good deed by Billy Fisher convinced Nancy Hire that they should become friends. Three weeks later, Nancy sat down to dinner with Billy and his father. Soon, two would be dead and a third missing. Authorities need your help to bring a killer to justice. Kristen Motoferi came to San Francisco for a summer of adventure. Then she vanished. Did she drown in the Pacific? Or was she lured into the arms of a murderer? Join me for these stories of intrigue and deception. Prime ingredients for unsolved mysteries. Nick Markowitz celebrates his bar mitzvah with dozens of friends and loved ones. It would be the last joyous occasion before tragedy rips a Markowitz family apart. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for the Markowitz! The seeds of that tragedy lie with Nick's older half-brother, Ben. For most of his life, Ben has been in trouble. And now young Nick is about to be engulfed in Ben's world of deceit and betrayal. Ben owes money to this man, Jesse James Hollywood, who was given his notorious name at birth. On August 6, 2000, Jesse allegedly decided to find Ben and collect what is owed him, one way or another. According to reports, Jesse and two of his friends cruise the quiet streets of West Hills, California, looking for Ben. They cannot find him, but instead spot Nick, a fateful decision is made. Nicky! Nick! Nicky! Hey guys. Where's Ben? I don't know. Huh? You don't know? No, I don't know. Uh, what do you mean you don't know? know? I think maybe you I do. don't know. I think you know. No, I don't. Yeah, you do I know. don't know. Don't you go I don't know. We'll no, about I gotta it. get going, man. I gotta no, get going. Come on. Witnesses say that they saw the van pull over and uh, there was a physical confrontation and that young Nick was forced into the van and the van left. On that day, he was simply uh, a young man who, uh, his only problem was that he had an older brother who had provoked the wrath of Jesse James Hollywood. At first glance, Jesse James Hollywood and his friends seemed like typical suburban teenagers. They grew up in loving middle-class homes and were given every chance to succeed in life. But somewhere along the way, Jesse allegedly went off track. When by chance, Nicholas Markowitz crossed Jesse's path, the result was catastrophic. Now one of them is dead and the other a fugitive from justice. As a child, there was no hint that Jesse James's outlaw name might turn out to be prophetic. Jesse and his close-knit group of friends would spend countless summer days playing baseball while their families watched with pride. But police believe that Jesse, the innocent little leaguer, somehow transformed into a big-time suburban drug dealer. Incredibly, at the age of 19, Jesse reportedly amassed enough illicit profits to buy an expensive home, and the party began. Jesse James Hollywood was driving expensive cars. He uh, was partying with his friends on nearly a daily basis. 
and he was living a rather lavish lifestyle for a young man without any legitimate means of employment. Less than two miles away, but a world apart, 15-year-old Nick Markowitz lived with his parents, Jeff and Susan. Uh, Nick um, was a typical teenager. He was a likable kid. Everybody loved Nick. He had a great sense of humor. He was uh, always positive um, and uh, fun to be around. But Nick's 25-year-old half-brother, Ben, was an entirely different story. According to police, Ben was a friend of Jesse Hollywood and often bought marijuana from him. Shortly before the kidnapping, Ben and Jesse had a falling out after Ben refused to pay a $1,200 drug debt. He's a real little guy. Very obnoxious, just the type of guy you'd want to take his stuff. I didn't fear him. He was, like I just said, he was just, Jesse was just a little man. <laughs> I was like, $1,200? Yeah, sure, I'll get you later, buddy. What's going on, Ben? Jesse, what are you doing? Where have you been? Jesse James Hollywood reportedly confronted Ben on several occasions. I told you I would get your money, all right? Don't come to my house like this, man. Don't come to your house. What are you smoking, huh? This is your last chance. You got that? After numerous run-ins with Ben, Jesse reportedly had had enough. And on August 6th, he went looking for his former friend. Nick Markowitz just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. I was making Nick breakfast and went upstairs to get him, and he was not there. I paged him, and he did not return my page. I guess I must have paged him a hundred times. I knew something was wrong. Police believe that Nick could not return his mother's call because Jesse James had kidnapped him. Nick was purportedly taken to a home in Santa Barbara, California and restrained. There he would remain a hostage until his brother Ben paid his debt. On the following day, Witnesses report seeing Nick at the Santa Barbara home. Jesse is not at the house. Nick is no longer bound nor gagged. In fact, Nick's captors seem to treat him like a guest. Nick was free to move around the residence. Uh, young people that did come and go from the residence, although they were told that he had been, in essence, kidnapped uh, by his demeanor there, he was not acting as they might expect someone that was had been kidnapped would be acting. I personally feel that Nick had the expectation that at some point in time he would be freed. Look, don't worry about him, he's fine. Right? In the ensuing days, there was no reported effort by Jesse James Hollywood to exchange Nick for the money Ben Markowitz owed him. According to witnesses, Jesse realized the situation was quickly spiraling out of control. He telephoned his lawyer for advice. That long? Oh, no, it can't be. Police believe that Jesse came to a disturbing realization if Nick was released and told authorities about the spontaneous kidnapping, Jesse could spend the rest of his life behind bars. We believe that as a result of that conversation, Jesse came to the conclusion that he would be in a better situation to kill Nick as opposed to trying to return him. Authorities theorize that Jesse then contacted this man, Ryan Hoyt, a 21-year-old acquaintance who also owed Jesse $1,200 for drugs. In this home video taken by Jesse James Hollywood, he can be heard demanding payment from Ryan Hoyt. You're saying you're going to get my money back on Monday? What's going to be there tomorrow, Hoyt? I'm serious, man. Stop recording. <laughs> so what's going to be in the bank? You never answered it. I want to know. $500. At least $500. Now stop fucking recording. Jesse allegedly offered Ryan a way to pay off his debt. Hey, Ryan, it's Jesse. Listen, I got a, uh, a little proposition for you. <laughs> On August 8th, police believe that Ryan Hoyt and two accomplices led Nick Markovich to Lizard's Mouth, a remote area in the Los Padres National Forest. Jesse James Hollywood was not there.
were friends. Uh, all of us were, we were friends. And the way that it went down, I feel very responsible for it. All I can really do is just overthink it in my head and, you know, believe me, there's many nights where I couldn't sleep. Four days later, the body of Nick Markowitz was discovered. An anonymous tip from a teenager who saw Nick at the Santa Barbara home quickly identified several suspects in his kidnapping and murder. Within days, police arrested Ryan Hoyt and three accomplices for the crime. All four have pleaded not guilty and remain in custody at the Santa Barbara County Jail. But Jesse James Hollywood was nowhere to be found. Authorities believe publicity about the murder caused Hollywood to flee. We don't know where he went. Uh, we don't know where he is now. But he did leave the jurisdiction eventually, and he returned uh, to the San Fernando Valley area. But since that time, his whereabouts have been unknown to us. The nightmares you wake up from, this is worse than a nightmare. They've destroyed me. They've gutted me. I am soulless. I am lost. Every evening at dusk, Eric and Marilyn Bierman perform a quiet ritual. The candle's flame represents the flicker of hope that they will solve a perplexing mystery that has shattered their lives. On May 31st, 2000, their 19-year-old daughter, Jill, looked forward to another morning indulging her passion for fitness. She left their home in Bloomington, Indiana at 9 a.m. Her job did not begin until noon. She had plenty of time to first enjoy the sport she loved best. Jill treated a bike ride like a workout. She took it pretty seriously, and she wanted to ride hard. And her friends have told me that going for a bike ride with Jill was not very much fun because they couldn't keep up. Jill had just completed her freshman year as a business major at Indiana University. Her family and friends described her as the epitome of a fun-loving, all-American girl. I found her purse. Twelve hours later, Eric and Marilyn became alarmed when Jill failed to return home. It's way after dark, it's very late, it's cold outside, and I was alternating between being sad or worried or maybe even angry, thinking, why would she do this? Why would she go off and not tell us what she's up to? I mean, just all those mixed emotions, I don't know what to think. It was then that we both were really, I think, terrified as to just what might have happened to her. Jill Beerman had vanished without a trace. Bloomington police and the FBI received over 3,000 tips. But what happened to Jill is still unknown. Authorities believe she might have been abducted, although there was no evidence to support that conclusion. They also thought she may have been the victim of a hit and run accident. But if that were true, where was her body? The investigation yielded many clues, but no answers. News of Jill's disappearance spread quickly throughout Bloomington. Two days after she vanished, townspeople by the hundreds joined investigators in an exhaustive search. Local cycling clubs traced the routes Jill may have taken. They had groups of people not only searching the roads, but about 150 feet or so off on each side of the road. And the woods and the ravines and the areas along several of the roads and, and places that we know that Jill liked to ride. 
Despite the massive effort, no trace of Jill was found. But the same day the search began, a vital clue surfaced. A resident of Bloomington stepped forward, reporting that he had retrieved an abandoned bicycle two days earlier, the same day Jill had disappeared. Only later, when news about Jill broke, did he realize its significance. The bicycle serial number enabled police to confirm that it was Jill's. Investigators searched the area surrounding where the bike was found. But they found nothing. The location raised their suspicions. Jill was last seen south of her home riding in a southerly direction. Her bike was 10 miles northwest of that site. That's not a route that she would have been on that day. Uh, that's about 10 miles away. It's through town. It's through a great deal of traffic. And Jill hated riding in any kind of traffic. She just, she wouldn't ride in the traffic. She's not with the bike. And the bike is somewhere she would not have ridden. And this isn't making any sense. This is even more mysterious and more scary now, because now I don't know what to think. Three days after Jill vanished, the mystery deepened. A digital radio was found neatly placed in the parking lot of a Bloomington church. It was the same model and color as one that Jill usually took with her when she cycled. At the moment the radio was found, a churchgoer in the parking lot witnessed a pickup truck that investigators viewed with suspicion. There's no indication that that pickup truck was related to the Walkman. However, we've attempted to try and find the, um, uh, not only the pickup truck, but certainly the, the individual driving it. We've been unsuccessful in doing that. 10 days later, a young woman Jill's age was involved in an attempted abduction just three miles from where Jill's bike was found. Uh, we certainly believe that there, there could be a, a correlation between the event in Ellisville and Jill's disappearance. Is it possible that the same assailant, who is still unidentified, also targeted Jill? We've had any number of theories in this, and certainly uh, one of those theories is that Jill was targeted. <gasps> and that uh, they placed the bicycle in an area different from where she was last seen in an effort to try and uh, uh, at least lead us away from the area in which she was, in fact, abducted. The possibility that Jill was abducted seemed more plausible when news broke a year later about another female cyclist in Kentucky. A motorist struck her and tried to drag her into his car before he was chased away by a witness. A police artist made this sketch of the suspect, but whether this man also attempted to abduct Jill is unknown. The only other theory investigators consider possible is that Jill was a victim of a hit and run accident. We believe that it was certainly possible that, that Jill was struck by a group of people who were high on drugs, alcohol, or both, that these folks panicked. And instead of leaving her or trying to get help for her, they put her and the bike in a vehicle and, and took her. The hit and run theory, however, is flawed by one perplexing detail. The damage to Jill's bicycle was minimal. Still, investigators say it is possible that Jill was not struck while riding but after she dismounted to rest or make repairs. Ultimately, however, what happened to Jill remains unknown. That's one of the hardest things about this whole situation, is the not knowing. Without knowing whether she's alive, without knowing where she is. I miss that smile. I miss her laugh. It's a nightmare that just keeps going on. Every night, we uh, light the candle on the front doorstep. And it stays lit all night until the next morning. It 
kind of a beacon of hope and just as a reminder that Jill is still missing. And every day we pray that that's going to be the day that we find Jill. Just pick up the from the park, 21-year-old Nancy Heyer and 19-year-old Billy Fisher met by chance in 1986. Okay. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. <laughs> Billy first saw Nancy on a train heading into New York City. She had become lost and was on the verge of tears. Billy stepped forward and volunteered to escort Nancy back home to Hicksville, Long Island. The two began a close friendship. Awesome. If, if you Nancy really, thought Billy was uh, like, a really I'm nice really guy. Sure. She, she did say to me, he's starting to look at me like a girlfriend kind of thing, and I don't like him that way. But she didn't want to hurt his feelings because he was so nice. On a stormy night three weeks later, Nancy received a call from Billy. I want to get home from work tomorrow, okay? All righty, I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. I wonder if I'll actually be able to follow these directions. She told her sister Deborah that Billy had asked for a ride home from his father's house in Southampton. Despite the weather, Nancy decided to repay Billy's earlier act of kindness. I don't really think you should be going out in this weather, Nancy. And I said, I can't believe you're gonna drive in this weather. You don't even like to drive at night. And she says, well, he's done so much for me that I'm gonna just go. All righty, I'm all ready to go. You look great. Thank you. Nancy's mother, Joan, was also concerned about her daughter driving during a storm. As I saw my daughter drive away, I, I was a little fearful myself. Worry. Just mother's worry. That's enough. Nancy Heyer set off into the downpour for the hour and a half drive to Southampton. Her friendship with Billy Fisher would soon lead to tragedy. An unsuspecting Nancy Heyer was heading straight into another family's conflict, one that was about to turn violent. Billy Fisher had cystic fibrosis, a degenerative respiratory disease, and was overwhelmed with medical bills. He was seeking money from his estranged father who'd abandoned the family 15 years earlier. What followed next was a chain reaction of ill-fated events that ultimately put Nancy Heyer in the wrong place at the wrong time. At the time Billy Fisher met Nancy, he was swamped in debt and increasingly ill. Hi, may I speak to William Fisher, please? He decided to ask his father, William, for help even though the two hadn't spoken in over a year. Hello? Hi, Dad. He Billy. was employed yes. by a well-to-do car dealership in Manhattan in the city of New York, was making a very high salary. The investigation determined that he began and had been using uh, cocaine extensively to the point that it affected his performance at his place of employment. Billy's father invited his son to visit for the weekend and discuss the money situation. Hey, Billy. How you doing? I'm OK. Come on, I'm not going to bite you. Nobody knows how Billy got to Southampton. But a day after arriving, he called Nancy Heyer to take him home. That night, Joan Heyer waited anxiously for Nancy to return. I was pacing the living room, constantly at the front door, looking out the window. The clock was going, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. I kind of figured she's a responsible girl. She might have had to stay over because of the weather or the time of night. But then I still kept... Uh, hesitant because I said she would never not call me. Yes, well, I know she's 21, but could you please The next morning, still no call. Joan began to panic. The police could not help. 
Nancy had not been gone long enough to be declared missing. Okay, Mom, I know she left directions and a phone number around her somewhere. I just, I don't know where she left it. Running out of options, Joan and Nancy's sister, Deborah, rummaged through her bedroom. No, oh, wait, here it is, um, Fisher. Uh, hello? Yes, uh, hello. Uh, this is Nancy Heyer's mother, Joan. Oh, Mr. Yeah. Fisher, yes. Uh, I'd like to know if my daughter came out there last evening. Yeah, she was here. Uh, I cooked a roast. Uh, we had some drinks and dinner. And for you, young lady? Um, medium rare? Okay. He said we, we had dinner. Cheers. Cheers. He said, and I gave them something to drink. Nice to see you, son. And, don't be and they went now. out after that. Well, listen, you both take care and drive safely. He said, oh, they probably just went somewhere, he says, or Billy somewhere and Nancy somewhere else. If I hear anything, uh, I'll give you a call. But, he seemed uh, very forthcoming know, do what you gotta do. that he was concerned about his own son. We were thinking at that point that young Billy had um, taken her somewhere and done something. Another day passed with no sign of Nancy, and Joan filed a missing persons report. But with no proof of foul play, there was little the police could do. So Joan turned back to the last Hello? person who saw her daughter. Yeah, I, I just want to get all my she repeatedly called William Fisher, who became increasingly confrontational. Mr. Fisher, uh, could you go over step by step exactly what happened that evening? Look, like I told you before, they came over. He would fly off the handle of and we had tell me, they let the police handle this. I have no idea where these kids went. And he was Look, getting really very, like very out, hostile kind of time here, over the okay? phone. Goodbye. So I kept getting more suspicious of Mr. Fisher. Ten days after Nancy's disappearance, in a parking lot two miles from William Fisher's house, police responded to a report of an abandoned car. Hey, boy, Nancy Heyer. Sarge, it comes back to that missing girl, Nancy Heyer. See if you can pop the trunk. Oh, my God. Sarge, get back here. Oh, my God. Uh, located in the trunk of the car was a young Billy Fisher. Uh, a second body was located on it, and that was uh, young Nancy. The autopsy reported that Billy uh, had been shot 18 times. The vast majority of those rounds were in the head at close range. Nancy's autopsy revealed that she had been stabbed twice with a very long, a sharp instrument. At that same time, neighbors reported strange activity at the Fisher home. Apparently, William was remodeling his master bedroom at 3 a.m. in the morning. Well, you can see it's been freshly painted. Police secured a search warrant for the Fisher residence. Slight indentations were observed on a section of the wall, and it was removed. Let's see what we find here. Two 22 caliber bullets were recovered. A single strand of hair was fused to one of the bullets. It was identified as Billy Fisher's. That established that this was the crime scene. Additional testing established that there was a large amount of blood splattered all about the halls of, of the hallway, uh, consistent with an individual, Nancy, being stabbed in that area immediately outside the master bedroom. Well, what does that mean? That means the evidence clearly implicated William working. Fisher, I'm but the sheer brutality of the, the killings hospital. obscured his motive. Well, everybody works to pay the bills, so what? <laughs> it's not enough. What I could have, have caused Fisher, a work. man with plenty to lose, enough to, to shoot his son 18 pay. times no. and then murder a complete stranger? You think I can afford to live here if I don't work? <coughs> Why don't you help me? This is about money, isn't it? Could an argument have broken out over Billy's financial problems? <laughs> Just the same as always, it's always about money, isn't it? It's you, 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 constantly. All the time. It's always about money. Nancy, who was only in the house because of an act of kindness, was now a witness to murder. 
And I can't uh, imagine a parent killing their own child and then taking someone else's child that they don't even know anything about. I just can't still today believe that anything could happen like this. Police sought a warrant for murder against William Fisher. But before it could be issued, Fisher disappeared. His car was found abandoned at JFK Airport. Police later discovered he had taken a second mortgage out on his house in excess of $100,000. William Fisher has evaded arrest on murder charges for nearly two decades. William Peter Fisher is 57 years old, 5 feet 11 inches tall and 185 to 200 pounds. These age-enhanced photos depict what Fisher may look like today. He wears expensive clothing, drinks heavily, and may have fled the country. San Francisco, California. 18-year-old Kristen Modaferi enjoys a summer of adventure. A college honor student, she is 3,000 miles from her home in North Carolina. The extended visit is a dream come true for a young woman eager to explore life on her own. Monday, June 23rd begins like any other day. At 7 a.m., she arrives at the upscale Crocker Galleria. She has taken a job at a coffee shop to pay for a photography course at UC Berkeley. Good morning, how are you? As always, she is eager to explore the city at the end of her shift, according to the new friends she had met, perhaps too eager. She wanted to come to the big city and find some excitement, but it seemed to be coupled with a a naivete, maybe, or not a real understanding of how the big city works. At 3 o'clock, Kristen leaves a coffee shop, then disappears without a trace. Kristen Modafferi's dream summer in San Francisco lasted only three weeks. The police would be frustrated by tantalizing leads that went nowhere. A mysterious blonde woman seen with Kristen, pages inexplicably torn from a diary, and an anonymous phone call directing them to a shadowy figure who may know what happened. The mystery is a nightmare not only for the police, but also for Kristen's parents. He's gone to the hotel. Yeah, we're here. Bob and Debbie Modaferi wasted no time after they learned Kristen had vanished. The following day, they flew the 3,000 miles from North Carolina. Thank you so much. Thank you. We appreciate it. Bye. When we found out that she had disappeared, we were just shocked. We couldn't eat. We, we barely spoke. Uh, we just were just even having trouble breathing. When you uh, are faced with a situation like this, you really don't know how strong you can be. You can either crawl in a hole and die and give up, or you can fight. And I think we, there was no choice for us. We were going to fight for our daughter. But finding Kristen would be a formidable task. Like many missing persons cases, it was difficult even knowing where to start. You don't have a crime scene. You have no witnesses. You can't even establish that a crime has occurred and you just kind of build on little pieces of information, hunches, whatever you can come up with, and see if you can uh, put the puzzle together. One of the first pieces of the puzzle was a sighting of Kirsten by one of her co-workers. 45 minutes after her shift ended, she was seen in the Crocker Galleria with a blonde woman. She thought that was kind of strange because she never really stuck around after work. As soon as she checked out, she was gone. And they were very close together, like they were hanging out together, talking together, definitely with each other. And so we've made a lot of effort to try to get the blonde woman to come forward, 
identify herself, and uh, we appealed a number of times through the media, but never got a response to all our appeals to the blonde woman to come forward. With few leads, the police took an unusual step. A bloodhound attempted to retrace Kristen's path from the coffee shop the day she vanished. When we were downtown, I could tell he was on a trail. He knew exactly where he was going. Every turn was perfect. The police could not be certain, however, that this was a path Kristen took the day she disappeared. It could have been a route Kristen had previously traveled without incident. He then led us up to Geary Street, heading out towards Land's End Beach. Kristen's co-workers had told police that on the day she vanished, she talked to visiting Land's End Beach. We then got down to the beach area and came to a point where the trail seemed to have stopped. A chilling possibility revealed itself. That's a very treacherous part of the San Francisco waterline. Numerous people each year are washed off the rocks and uh, are never seen again. So that was a distinct possibility that she had, in fact, uh, fallen into the ocean. We really don't believe that's what happened to Kristen. It's a very tourist-oriented area. There's always people around. If she had fallen into the water, uh, somebody would have seen something. If Kristen did not suffer a tragic accident, what became of her? ABC 7. A startling twist to the mystery occurred 17 days after she vanished. An anonymous male telephoned a San Francisco TV newsroom. He said Kristen had been murdered. Okay, how do you know these two women? He went into a very long description of who he said killed her. And he told me that there were two women, and he named them. And he said that Kristen had been killed as a result of a lesbian love affair that went wrong. Detectives tracked down the two women named by the caller, but determined they did not know Kristen and had nothing to do with her disappearance. We then asked these people, who has a grudge against you? Who would want to see you go through this? And each person, separate and independent, um, gave the name of John. All right, so I made the phone call, so what? John, who asked us not to use his last name, told police that two women were his girlfriend's employers. He claimed they were harassing her at work. To get back at them, he said, he phoned in the false tip. He said he got the idea when he saw TV news coverage about Kristen, and he knew nothing about the case beyond what he saw on television. Still, the police suspected there was more to John's story. They investigated his background and discovered disturbing allegations of previously abusing women. The next step was to determine whether he had any connection to Kristen. Police say that John met women largely through personal ads. Come on, the other guy. here it is right here. I bet you this one's it. Check it out. Previously, they had found an ad in Kristen's apartment they think she might have placed. If you read it, Sounds like it could be Kristen. It's, it's all the kind of things she was interested in. It was just photography, uh, walking the city, um, music, art. It was all the kind of things that uh, Kristen was there to do. If the ad had brought Kristen and John together, a baffling piece of the puzzle could now be seen in a new light. John, we were told, used other women to lure women to himself. So we felt that uh, perhaps this blonde woman could have been a plant to draw Kristen to this John. So how long have you known John? The police uncovered more troubling pieces of information from the women John allegedly abused. One of them claimed he made an alarming reference to Kristen. That's what he said. Now you know what I did to Kristen. Don't make me do it to you. I never made a statement like that. John agreed to do an interview with us on condition that we not reveal his face and alter his voice. The reason she made that statement was she was angry that I was leaving San Francisco. I was leaving her, and I didn't want her anymore. She was very angry, very bitter. 
One more troubling coincidence was discovered at the home of John's girlfriend. Her diary was missing several pages, pages covering the same time period Kristen had been in San Francisco. We asked her, why is this the way it is? And she told us that John had torn the pages out and said that some of the stuff that was in there could come back to hurt him. Despite such disturbing pieces of information, police say they have no clear evidence that John had any involvement in Kristen's disappearance. Also, John says he has taken and passed a polygraph examination conducted by a reputable expert. At the very least, this John made a stupid, stupid mistake by making this phone call to the TV station. But if he is more involved, then we still need to find out those answers, and we still need to keep after him until we find out whether or not he's guilty. I never met Kirsten. I never saw her. There's absolutely no connection to Kirsten and I in any way. And what I did was wrong. I wish I never made that call. But I did. And I just want to tell the parents how sorry I am. I'm really, really sorry for what I did. Kristen Modafferi had come to San Francisco embracing a future full of promise. What shattered that future remains a mystery. For her parents, the search for answers continues. We owe this to her, we owe this to ourselves, and we owe this to her sisters. Someone stole Kristen's dreams, and uh, that's not fair. Join us for our next edition of Unsolved Mysteries.